it's my real pleasure to, to announce and introduce uh, Johan de Jong from Columbia, Columbia University, who will tell us about affineness of the complement of the ramification locus. Go ahead, Johan. All right, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, right. Um, okay, uh, well, uh, this is just a random talk I made up uh, when Jared asked me to speak. So I hope you I hope you enjoy it. And I also hope you'll uh, try to prove something uh, about these questions. Okay. So, um, so the question is uh, that I want to talk about is uh, the following. So we have some some schemes which are they're always going to be separated now if you're in excellent. Can you see my pointer? Okay, great. And let's say uh, we're going to have a morphism from x to y, and let's say on top we have a normal one integral, and at the bottom we have a regular integral scheme, and then we have a dominant finite type morphism, and then the relative dimension um, is going to be the dimension of the generic fiber, so the the difference of the dimensions of x and y. Oh, sorry, and um, okay, and the singular locus is the locus where uh, F is in the smooth morphism, that's a closed subset of X. And the purity question that uh, I want to talk about is, is it true that the co-dimension of the singular locus in X is at most one plus the relative dimension? And um, this is, um, so, and you don't have to worry about what notion of co-dimension you put here because the question is local on X. So you can actually always assume that the singular locus is just irreducible. And then there's no, con there cannot be any confusion. And then um, the reason that this is a, re a reasonable inequality is that, um, for example, X and Y could both be smooth varieties and F could be a more sum of varieties. And then you're just looking at the, uh, the matrix of part partial derivatives of the map and uh, you're looking where that it doesn't have maximal rank and it's a matrix of size, the dimension of X times the dimension of Y, and then you'll easily see that the co-dimension is indeed at most this one plus the, dimen the relative dimension. Okay, so if both X and Y are smooth, this is true, and it's easy to prove. Okay, and so, but um, let's now let's do some cases where uh, it is known. So for example, suppose we're looking at the relative dimension zero case, um, then if the morphism is quasi-finite, so if the fibers are finite, then uh, this is well known and it's called the risky Nagata purity of the ramification locus, right? It's that the ramification locus has pure codimension one and X. And if you have a, a barational uh, map, if X to Y is barational, then it's called the Van der Waarden purity. Van der Waarden showed that the, the set of points where it is in an isomorphism is, is a divisor. And then I was surprised um, to learn that, um, that this in general uh, wasn't known and it's a, I found it in this uh, preprint of Zong and I checked this morning, it hasn't been published yet. There's an argument by Gobber uh, from 2014 where, where it is shown in the general case of relative dimension zero. And by the way, anybody who has additional references, um, I would appreciate it if you just email me some, some references if that uh, aren't mentioned here. Okay, great. Um, but actually in the relative dimension zero case, um, there's a discussion in EGA4 section 21.12, which suggests that something slightly better is true. Namely that um, the locus, the smooth locus of the morphism is affine in the total space, okay? And actually I will explain to you today the proof of the following theorem that if X and Y are in echo characteristics, so if, if they're living over a field, say, um, right, and, then, and you have the relative dimension zero case, then the embedding of the complement of the single locus into X is an affine morphism. Okay, and now this theorem, of course, applies the purity uh, because everybody probably knows, everybody who's listening probably knows that sort of the complement of an affine open in a variety is pure co-dimension one. Um, and, uh, and so it applies it, except that the, as you will see, the proof will actually use this general case of the purity uh, proven by Gower. So 
I'm not saying that I'm, I found a new proof of the three cases. I'm just saying that it's, it's sort of a better statement. And it's a, just a general thing that you should pay attention to that if you have some codimension one statement that you can prove, then you should always look for whether you can prove this affineness statement. And so I was looking for this also in the mixed characteristic case, and I, I don't know how to do it. If you have an idea, please, please let me know. Uh, I think it's interesting. Okay. So, um, great. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to be, let me go back. So, so I'm going to be talking about the proof of this theorem now. Okay, I, I hope you remember the notation. So, um, uh, you can find the slides also on, uh, online on the WAGON website. Um, okay, so now you, whenever you prove this kind of statement, you can uh, do induction on the dimension and uh, you can sort of focus in on one point and you will know that away from this point, everything you ever wanted to know is already true. Okay, so then you reduce to the following. You have a, a morphism of sort of local schemes. So X is the close point of X and little Y is the close point of Y. And the dimension of Y is at least two. X will be a singular point of, in the singular locus of the morphism. And then V, which is the complement of the singular locus, we already know that away from little x, we have the theorem already. So we already know this embedding is a fine if you think of it as an embedding into the complement of little x. Okay, and then we know because it's relative dimension zero that v is a tile over y. And our goal is to show that actually uh, in this local case, we're trying to show that v is an affine scheme, right? Because we, we want v to x to be affine, and x is already affine in the local case, so we want to prove that v is affine. Okay. And uh, the proof will have three steps. We're going to look at the cohomology modules of v. We're going to prove a structure theorem about them. Then we're going to use this to, to show that if we have some vanishing, we get affineness, and then we're going to see why the vanishing is true. Okay. So the first step is to the following lemma. It says that the, uh, the cohomology of the structure sheaf of V um, is a direct sum for I big and zero of copies of the injective hull of the residue field of the point at the bottom over this, lo this, this right, this o OYY is a regular lo local range, right? Okay, so that's great because we know a lot we, we know the structure of injective hull of the residue field exactly, so this will help us in the next step. And this is kind of a standard um, thing that um, commutative algebraists probably know very well. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So let me tell you the proof. Um, so V is a tall over Y. Um, so if you have like, say you have a derivation of the local ring down here, that's just, Y is a spectrum of this thing, right? So you have a differential operator there. Well, then you can locally, because of atomus, uniquely lift that differential operator to the structure sheet of V. So that's going to act on the cohomology also. Just you compute it by the check complex. It's going to act on the whole check complex. Okay, so that's, a, that's not true for an arbitrary cohomology class, right? Okay, and in positive characteristic, that's still true, but actually for the argument, you should use the Frobenius. All right, so let me skip that. Um, also, because we already know the affineness of V into, um, into here, can you see the highlight? Okay, uh, then we already know that there is sort of no, the cohomology here has no supports away from the close point at the bottom. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a torsion module. It's a MY power torsion module. And then there's a structure theorem that says that if you have over a power series ring, if you have any module, uh, which is torsion for the maximum ideal, power, power torsion, and uh, the field K is characteristic zero and all differential operators act, then it has to be a direct sum of copies of the, re of the injective hull of the residue field. And so then you get the lemma. So that, that wasn't so bad, okay. Um, and okay, so now we're going to use this in the next lemma. If I claim that if we can show that 
Um, for the mentioned reasons, already we already know because v doesn't. Okay, the dimension of v will be so small that anything beyond dim y minus one will already know it's zero. Okay, so I claim that if we know that this cohomology group is zero, then we know that v is affine. Okay, so how? Let me explain the proof. Okay, so this is kind of a fun trick uh, here. So, so, so we know that the closed point downstairs is not in the image of the morphism from P to Y. So by flat base change, um, we'll, uh, we'll know that this derived tensor product here is zero. Oops. Oh, I can't highlight that. Okay. And then if you compute it, um, the torus of uh, this injective hull, E was this injective hull. So we know the cohomology groups of this complex are dark sums of the injective hull of the residue field. And it turns out that um, uh, the, the, the torus of E with the residue field are all zero except in the degree equal to the dimension. And so if you then work out what this means, this vanishing of this derived tensor product, then you're gonna end up getting that this ring tensor with the residue field is zero, and therefore the maximum ideal of y times this ring is the whole ring. So you can write one in gamma v o v as a linear combination of coordinates from downstairs times functions on v. Okay, but then v has to be affine because we already know by this sort of induction thing again, we know that this, we already know this is affine because this is an uh, v to the complement. So when I take away the little x, I already know that the assumption is true. So d of this is an affine thing. So this will be, uh, when I pull it back to x, it will be affine and then intersecting it with v will be affine because it doesn't contain little x. And then there's this lemma in Hartzern that says, you have a bunch of functions on a variety Whenever you set one of them not equal to zero, you get an affine thing, and those functions generate the unit ideal in the global sections of the of the of the uh, variety. Then the variety is affine. Okay, great. And now the proof is basically done. Uh, namely, so okay, dim x is at most dim y, um, and now by the purity. So here I'm using this Gover result. We, we already know that this open V isn't all, just the complement of the closed point. And therefore, the cohomology of the structure sheaf on V, it has to vanish in dimension of X minus one and, uh, and higher. And that's, that's by this famous theorem uh, of Hartzorn and Lichtenbaum. So it's in the paper of Hartzorn. So the, the corresponding projective statement is that if you um, if you take projective space and you or any projective variety of dimension d and you take just out one close point, then the then h d of the structure sheaf of that complement of the close point is zero. That's what and the analog with uh, in the local situation for local rank the analog is this one. And so we can apply this lemma up here and therefore v is f. Okay, so that's a proof. Um, how am I doing uh, with time? Okay, um, great, uh, good. Okay. Do about uh, five minutes, I think. Okay, great, okay. So, um, yeah, so for relative dimension bigger than zero, I am not so sure that the answer to the question should be yes, okay? That this purity should be true. Um, now, Dolkachev showed that if the morphism is a local complete intersection morphism, then it's true. Essentially, because you can kind of, um, the way I think about it is you can reduce back to the, to the case where both X and Y are smooth, but um, that's just how I think about it. Uh, and you can find, there's a paper by Rolf Kellstrom, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, that does that and a lot more if you're interested. Um, but of course, you can also look at the original papers by Dolkachev. Um, great. Then, um, besides this Dolkachev result, I know how to prove one case, and let me let me try to explain this. Okay. 
So um, here. So suppose we're in the relative dimension one case. So we have a, a local morphism. The bottom is regular of dimension two. And now suppose it's just singular at the close point. So we so what we have is like a we have a, a family of curves which is singular in one point of one fiber where the base has dimension two. And we want to show it doesn't happen. And so then you have to, and I know how to prove this because I know that the corresponding thing doesn't happen when you have a proper flat family of curves and there is just one point of one fiber where you have a singularity because um, Marby proved that there's some, there's a, uh, there's purity for families of smooth proper curves. Meaning that if you have a, um, a regular base um, and you have a proper flat family of curves um, um, and you have uh, over the complement of something of co-dimension at least two, then you can extend it to a family of smooth proper curves. Okay. And so, um, yeah, great. So let me, let me do this thing. So I, but that's different, right, from what I have here. Here I have the local case, right? So now let me do this trick where I show you a picture. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> All right, let's try. Oh, wait, it still says hi. <laughs> okay, can you see this? All right. So I have some singularity and I have a way of deforming it over a two-dimensional base. Woo. Okay, that's a two-dimensional base. And then all the other fibers are smooth and this fiber only has one singularity, but it's local. Okay, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna glue on, yeah, now th this, is this is bad. I'm gonna glue on a global curve. I'm just gonna glue it to the singularity so that it's smooth everywhere except at this one point. And now I know for everybody, may have seen this, like if you have a curve, then the deformation theory of the curve is unobstructed except for where you have the singular points. So for any deformation of this singularity, you can deform the whole global curve with it so you can extend it. Can... Okay, and now what, but now, um, so I was gonna put here deform. Okay, and now you have this uh, global family of curves and then you can apply this um, uh, result of MARA-B and uh, produce a contradiction. And let me, let me stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Johan, for that wonderful talk. Uh, let's all, all thank him either in chat or, or by clapping in, in your homes <laughs> or, or watching the class. Um, all right, so we, we do have a bit of time for questions. Um, so please type your questions into chat. Um, or into the Q&A box. Actually, maybe the Q&A box is better since there's so many people typing clap, clap into chat. Uh, in the meantime, there were a couple questions that came up during the talk. Um, so I, I had a question. Um, so so my, my question is just, is the only place where you used echo characteristic, that first lemma, where you used that characterization of uh, the injective hole of the rescue field? That's right, yeah. Okay. Very good, yes, excellent. Um, and uh, Dan Edidin asks uh, if there's a statement if X is an Arden stack. For example, could the complement be cohomologically affine? Ah, but um, okay, but then you um, right? Yes, I mean, yeah, and if if you somehow um, suitably uh, define what it means to for the morphism to be sort of dominant have all the properties that my morphism had. Yes, I, I bet there is, yeah. Um, let's see, uh, so, so Raju Krishnamurti wants to know what is the Frobenius trick in characteristic P in step one? Right, so that's what, um, th what you were asking uh, Daniel, right? So it's that uh, if you have a module over a ring like this, can you see, highlight, okay. Uh, and K has characteristic P, you have a module over that, it's, it's a 
torsion, it's supported at the close point, and you have a Frobenius uh, endomorphism so that um, when you base extend, it's an isomorphism after tensoring with the <laughs> over the Frobenius with this ring. Um, yeah, does it make sense? Sorry, I. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, Alexander Borisov wants to know Has the toric case been considered? I, I assume in mixed characteristic or maybe in the higher relative dimension situation. I'm not quite sure what, what that means. Yeah. So, so maybe uh, if, if you can type a clarification into chat, that might help. Um, and then I think there was a question that came up in chat during the, during the talk, uh, which was just if you could say a little bit about the induction step. Right. So once you have formulated it in, in this kind of local case, Right, then you can say uh, the induction assumption is uh, just a dimension of the local ring at little x. Right, and then you so you know, so then you'll know for every other point on capital X here, you'll know it's true. In, you know, after replacing by the local ring at that point, and that's going to tell you, for example, that's going to tell you that this is an affine morphism. I mean, and, and other things that I use later in the proofs, yeah. Great, and I, there was a clarification of the, the question from before. So, so I think the question about toric things was about the higher relative dimension case. Like if you have a higher a toric morphism of relative dimension, are these trojan questions known or easy? Hey, that's great. Like, yeah, somebody should try to make a kind of example that way. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful, yeah. Um, and then I think maybe we have time for one final question, which, uh, so Dan Dor asks, uh, apart from the fact that it hasn't been proved, are there plausible, plausible heuristics uh, for why the result might fail or be true, uh, or the affineness result might fail or be true in, in higher, higher dimension, I guess. Uh, like so, basically, I guess the question is, what do you think happens in higher relative dimension? Right, so wait, so let's go back here, right? So. The purity question says the co-dimension should not be too high, but as soon as the relative dimension is one, you, you have examples where the co-dimension um, is two, and so the complement of the singular locus cannot be affine in X. Um, but I think the uh, reason I'm not sure that this is the right question is because I just said, let's let X be normal. Whereas when you look at this uh, thing that was proved, proven by, um, Dokerchev, there was a more assumption that was essentially saying that it's an LCI scheme. So I just don't want to presume that it's true. I don't have a good reason that it's true with only assuming normal. So it could be that, that, that the singularities of X have to be in a certain class for the purity question to be true. Um, yeah. Great, thank you so much, Johan.